Good morning. Anybody that doesn't know me, my name is Ian Moore. Um, I'm a wharf rat from Halifax, and um, our goal is this morning is to try and share my passion for ships with you. Uh, many of you I know already have that passion for ships, and I would be only too happy to exchange information and viewpoints and techniques with you. Um, I, I've been asked by Bill, thank you uh, Bill for, for sponsoring us here. I appreciate that and uh, all the technical support. The hobby goes back a long ways for shipbuilding, but in the last 60 odd years or 70 years that I've been working on ships, it's seen a huge evolution from the old Lindbergh crap um, up to uh, Airfix and uh, uh, Skywave and Tamiya and on and on. And uh, certainly we can talk at length about the future, which is a lot of 3D printing, but you know, kits are here to stay as well. Um, so I just wanted to try and cover off some of the basics uh, for anybody that is a novice to shipbuilding or maybe just hasn't run across that technique before. Um, the, the best thing I can recommend is research, research, research. Do your homework. Um, I spend a lot of time on Facebook watching guys that are have very basic questions and really have no idea where to look. Uh, but they have to at least be able to Google first and then ask the question. Um, there's all sorts of really good references out there, but there's all sorts of references you can't trust. Um, Cross-check against good ship plans, if you can get them. They're in lots of books. They're in lots of, uh, lots of sources. The intent or the way the question for this was originally posed was how, um, where do I start? Well, you know, I, I've named this 50 Shades of Grey and it's a bit of a, a pun because ships really aren't all just gray, as you probably know. They have a lot of color, but uh, I've always been a stickler for getting the colors right. Uh, for example, uh, it's just recently been found that a lot of the RN capital ships had gray bottoms, not red. Too many times you see uh, ships with uh, bright red hulls and it's, that's seldom what you see in real life. Uh, also, one of my pet peeves, uh, which uh, the model companies haven't corrected, is that Corvettes did not have red bottoms. They had black bottoms, almost invariably. If there was any red, it was rust. Okay, um, so use a good source of plans. Rescale the plan, if possible, down to the scale you're working in. And that's primarily why I only work in 700 or 350. 700 is getting a little rinky-dink for me now. I can't see that well, or well enough. Uh, so I prefer to do 350, but I've also delved into the 72nd scale for whatever ships I can. The reason I say check your plans, um, for example, on tribals, a lot of people use the Canadian Tribal Kit because it's available uh, from Trumpeter as a supposedly Canadian ship. Well, it's actually the British version of the tribal. The bow is a little wrong. You need to modify the boats, modify the, uh, the uh, gun platforms, and the number of scuttles or portholes on the ship on the Canadian version were half of those on the British version. So you have to fill them in and re-drill re them, just as, an, as one example. Um, so starting on the bottom, use a, a jig, turn the ship upside down, get the seams done properly. Uh, so I'll, I'll usually uh, tape off above the waterline with Tamiya tape, spray the primer, uh, black primer on it. If it's to be a red bottom hull, then I will 
mask the water line with a thin strip of Tamiya tape. Usually the flexible stuff is better. Um, and then I will overspray the black below the water line with the red. Before you do that, of course, you have to uh, replace the propeller shafts with some uh, good stock uh, wire or, or uh, brass tubing. And um, then drill some holes for mounting it. I'll almost invariably I'll mount the ship on a couple of pieces of basswood to hold it while so I'm not handling it Afraid while I'm doing sorry. it. I will remove the mask from the upper above the waterline, spray the camo pattern, uh, basic color on the hull, use the uh, camouflage template and mask off that, spray the different colors, then work on the decks above that. I'll very often hand paint the decks uh, or at least spray vertically if the hull is still taped and or use the applique uh, art walks. Oh, right in front of me. Um, use the art walks thing. So here's my Kent which I'm working on. There's the bottom hull masked and um, the upper hull camel pattern is on. And it's going to be a two color gray. So as you can see, you just peel off the tape, you peel off the water line, and you've got both the water line and the lower hull all, all done. Then apply the applique deck. The, the wood decks are really fantastic in my opinion. Not all ships use them, and a lot of the time in the Royal Navy, they would stain them with, uh, with bunker oil to darken down the, the hull tone because it, it destroyed the camouflage effect, um, but then they buffed them back at the end after the war was over. Most ships had a, a dark gray or mid gray uh, finish except for those had, that had Semtex or linoleum decks and they usually generally had those only in portions. The, uh, There's been a lot of questions on Facebook and the internet about the applique decks as to whether they're good enough, do they raise or they, do they bubble. Yes, they sometimes bubble, but that's not been my experience. Uh, if you start with a section and unroll the and pull the backing off, as long as you make sure that you start at a, at a spot where you, you've got the, the line up absolutely right, and peel the peel it on and push it down as you do. Uh, I've never had it come up. Um, some of the cheaper ones might be guilty of that. If they do, um, then a simple slice with a scalpel and a little bit of a um, little bit of glue under. Um, if you put the inject the super glue under the sliced uh, on the deck, push it down. If you leave marks on it, um, then you could easily sand the deck. That's the nice thing about wood, it's sandable. So that's, that's sort of the basic technique for getting started on the hull and, uh, and the upper works. Uh, I almost always, uh, I think most people probably do the superstructures as sub-assemblies and mask them and paint them and then mount them. You may have to cut away a little bit of the wood decks if there's an applique in the way, but make sure that the seam gets down tight. I almost always drill out all my scuttles. Then when you do your wash, I'll use a, a, a piece of brass wire with black paint on it to put the depth in the scuttle because an unpainted uh, hole will not show up very much. And uh, interesting thing about talking about hull bottoms since uh, we are talking Fifty Shades of Grey. The Italians usually use green, Russians use red, uh, depending on the t era of the time frame. Um, the British both use red lead and grey lead. Uh, the Canadian Navy currently uses blue, so both of those ships would have blue bottoms now. Um, and it weathers to a, a nasty looking grey, but blue is, is what you often see. Um, 
submarines are the easiest starting point to build ships. Um, and ironically, most of the time, black is probably the last color you should use for doing subs because even though they show up as black, um, a charcoal or a gray or a little off black is probably a, a better way to go. And again, below the water lines, they'll often have uh, a red lead or a, uh, a green algae uh, growing on them. So to me, a green is very good for, uh, clear green, sorry, is very good for getting that algae effect on the weathering. Boot topping options. Not all ships had boot topping. Uh, a lot of World War I vessels didn't. The gray would go right down the water line and then your red lead would go from there down. Uh, similarly, uh, I've got lots of color pictures of Canadian ships. There's the Sault Ste. Marie on the Great Lakes just after being built. Red lead below and camouflage right down the water line. And that was, that was common. A lot of MTBs had copper hulls because they were wood and the copper paint would uh, prevent the worms, although they do paint them. But again, as you can see, uh, if you can see, all the, the water lines are usually pretty scruffy because they were in oil-soaked oil harbors. And in fact, this boat was one of the ones lost in Ostend when they, some guy threw a cigarette into the harbor and blew the whole fleet, uh, whole squadron up, which was uh, one of Canada's biggest tragedies. Uh, application of brass and photo etch. I'm a great fan of photo etch. Um, there's a lot of different brands available. I'm very pleased that most of the trumpeter kits like the the Abercrombie and the Roberts come with a full set of brass in them. You don't really have to go aftermarket because the kit's including it. Uh, and that's more and more the case with trumpeter. Uh, Flyhawk kits also have all sorts of brass. So to apply the photo etch, my favorite thing tool is, is kind of beaten up right at the moment, but that's my super glue applicator. You get a piece of the control rod tubing, which is pretty hard. Do a stretch sprue bit with it because when you stretch the sprue, it will uh, it will thin out, and a, a stretched hollow it becomes a hollow stretch tube. You just cut off the top of the super glue bottle. I didn't cut this one off far enough. You pull that up through the nozzle and let it let it glue itself in but the hole won't won't uh, clog if it does clog you just snip off the end of it and start uh, but you know, it takes you can develop really good uh, lower arm muscles squeezing the bottle to get the stuff down but uh, I mentioned references and one of the best things are some of the books available online now uh, David Griffiths did one on scale ship modeling, which is available online uh, as a free purchase. Well, sorry, at Amazon probably charge you 15 bucks for it, but it's half the price of the, of the text. And it's got really good tips on things, and a lot of them recommend super gluing your um, photo etch down in two inch strips. Don't try to do the whole length of the deck because it'll invariably uh, get tension on it and, and spring. Um, yeah, I much prefer the photo etch with the bottom bottom rail, like Edward or one of those. And invariably, I will um, sorry. Invariably, I will prime it first. To me, a fine primer works great. It's a generic color. Uh, unfortunately, for the Canadian stuff, you have to paint it black and white afterwards, but or black and gray, but a, it, a good primer uh, will help it. And you want a rail with the bottom rail available so you can glue that to the edge of the deck. It's really convenient when you have a, a wood deck because you can, you usually have a lip right along the edge of the deck and they can get the, the uh, photo etch to snuggle in quite nicely. Um, then smooth it in with PVA glue. Uh, water soluble, but it'll hold it strongly and keep it on. Uh, you can tape it temporarily until you get this on, but just run a little wire with a, a bead of that on, then wipe it off with water and 
it usually it's got a pretty smooth joint and it won't come off. Um, I mentioned waterline boot topping options. The uh, You can uh, do the paint deal the way I did it, uh, which is what I prefer. You can also use drafting tape. You can use uh, motor pinstriping tape, depending on how wide you need it. You can use decal sheets, which uh, again, you can trim to the right, right size. For example, hood had eight foot waterline black, uh, which is kind of hard to find in a pinstripe tape. Um, for something um, like the 700 scale stuff, the water lines are just a black felt tip pen and run it along at a, at a 45 degree ang angle carefully, retouch any parts that you, that you miss. Uh, be careful because the indelible ones are really hard to cover with paint afterwards if you make a mistake. But it can be done. Um, so the the process for the super glue applicator, you pull a pull it uh, like stretching sprue. Don't pull it too tight, or you won't be able to get the get it out the hole. Snip it in half, and you've got two applicators for for one stretch and uh, you can replace it, pull it out, and replace it whenever you need to. Be careful though, if it doesn't seal in itself into the nozzle of the glue, you've got to watch that it doesn't have a great huge drip coming down your, your arm. We talked about main decks and superstructures. Um, getting a tight joint is, is good. Um, I, if you run into problems with the joints, I'll use the bond of the yeah, the Bondo Glaze and Spot Putty, it not only is the color red lead, but it will give you a good idea. It dries hard, can be sanded very quickly, and uh, will close off any gaps or joints that you, you run into. Most kits are pretty good. If you take your time with them and the, get the joints right, you're, you're home free. Masts. I almost invariably will replace my masts or plastic masts with wire or uh, uh, steel rod or, or flower floral wire. I always uh, Bill sells the uh, the KNS brass. I go through a lot of that. That's good for cross members and stuff. You can get floral wire or you can get KNS stock in in larger stuff as well. And again, if you need to taper the mast, I'm not that particular about it, but you can put it in a, a Dremel tool and taper it out and make yourself a nice sharp needle to stick yourself on. But you know, masts need to be erect and solid and uh, you can then put your cross members or your yards on, uh, usually uh, cut a small notch in it and tie it in or solder, solder the yard in and then you can I spent an hour and a half this week trying to get easy line to go through the brass eyelets on a yard arm and I could not get you know so at some point you run into that frustration of not being able to work it. I much prefer to use tippet line which is a nylon fishing line. Come, I can, you can get it in brown, you can get it in black. Tippet line. There's, there's multiple brands. In Halifax, there was a fly fishing shop that used to get this stuff from Germany in a two pound test, and it was the finest, nice brown line you could ever see. They don't make it anymore, unfortunately. Um, but you, I've gotten two or four pound uh, line that's not too bad, and, and I've used a lot of it on some of these, some of these ships. Uh, rigging becomes a real issue uh, because you've got to work both the standing rigging and the running rigging. The standing rigging supports the mast, usually goes like a triangle or a pyramid shape, uh, four corners away from the mast, both on, on a, every level of the mast. So you start on the inside and or inboard side and work out, out, outboard. That 
sometimes then makes it difficult to do the running rigging, which is the, the halyards down from the yard arms for the signal flags and so on. But, you know, again, it can be done. If you make the mistake, as I did with this one, uh, and use cotton thread, wax it first. Otherwise, it will absorb water and eventually become very loose. Um, or you can, uh, or you can dry it out with a hair dryer and get the water out of it. Then you might melt the ship. So there, there's there's lots of different little techniques. Um, insulators can be just white glue, painted black, or dyed with a little drop of black paint in white glue before you put it on the on the line, and you've got a, a ready-made insulator. I use wire uh, for most aerial aerials. Um, Patrick was mentioning that he uses uh, fine. Uh, hair from uh, paint brushes and so on, and that, those would work well. Um, they're pliable, they don't break. Wire I use because it's more solid and if it breaks it's going to take the whole piece off, but it can be easily replaced. Again, spray your photo etch before you use it and then retouch it once it's, once it's aboard and in place. Um, just a, a quick talk about or mention of upper deck colors. A lot of color schemes on kit instructions will show you, you know, a bright green or a, a tan or linoleum red. And those were colors that were used quite frequently, especially during the war. Um, Semtex was a, in fact, there's a, if I can find it here quickly. Yeah, there's a picture on a Canadian frigate. Um, so it shows the color of the Semtex and the the medium gray uh, hull, deck hull color, uh, but the Semtex uh, running along the side. And that's an anti-slip coating and weathered pretty darkly, so it doesn't go on as light tan. It, it darkens down pretty quickly. Um, you can also find uh, a red color uh, that's the linoleum, which for example, the hood upper works, the bridges and so on, the hood were all all a linoleum color. Japanese ships all usually had linoleum decks, again as anti-slip. Class conversions. I love to do Canadian vessels because that's what I grew up watching. I my my bedroom as a kid looked out on the Halifax dockyard. I had Bonnie back Bonnie on at the NAG jetty in my backyard for a month or so. So I spent a lot of time uh, uh, looking out at ships and, and enjoying watching the ships move movement. And the visiting ships I spent every weekend I could aboard visiting ships because those days you could. Uh, Navy days were the big celebration for the chance to get out with a camera and take pictures of everything. Um, because that's when you did your walk arounds and so on. So scale, yeah, my, my point was scale plans are very, very useful for conversions. To do a lot of Canadian vessels, because we had a small ship navy, still do, um, and a small navy at that, but the, uh, the number of ships that we had is truly astounding. Many of them have to be converted from other kits and from other countries' vessels. You know, um, we didn't have carriers the size of of uh, Kuznetsov or or uh, Enterprise. To do conversions, um, it, it's a challenge, and having done many, many, many kits out of the box and not, not particularly well, I now find the challenge of building from scratch and building conversions much more fun. Um, just as an example, this one was the, uh, the Calypso, which was on the shelf here. Uh, and this one was also the Calypso, but is now the Aurora, which was our first uh, uh, World War, War, War post-World War I cruiser that was at the Battle of Jutland and we kept for a year and then scrapped because it was a gift from the Royal Navy. Um, another example, the Belfast, which is currently in London. And I've also done 
the uh, Quebec and the Ontario from her. Um, the lines plan I got from um, the Fiji class uh, cruiser hulls, which were uh, Sandbrook marine plans. Um, sources of plans are varied. There's a lot of stuff on uh, floating dry dock that you can get free. Uh, French Marine Museum used to have a lot of, and because we donated a lot of ships to, to France after the war, uh, a lot of the stuff the French Navy had on their website was plans of Canadian minesweepers, for example. Esquimalt Military Museum is a great source for uh, Canadian plans, and they're digitizing all their shipping plans. Uh, unfortunately, they only have ones that were on the west coast, but they're, they're out there. You can get a CD, fold them for 40 bucks. Um, Bill so sells all the, uh, a lot of the Canadian ships uh, here, and uh, uh, those are also uh, Monroe's plans were good, uh, simple, basic plans to work with. And generally they're as built. The so thing the to thing. look for are, are good quality plans. Compare them, usually if you can get more than one source, because uh, Kit instructions, color schemes, and plans are not always very accurate. And anybody that's built the hood knows you've got 14 pages of corrections to the trumpeter kit if you're gonna, gonna work on the hood. Uh, many of which were may have been minor, but uh, they're worth doing. The other challenge on is, is scratch building. Um, this uh, YMS is an example of the uh, tender that was used to HMCS Discovery. And it's a fiberglass hull, which uh, HM, MTB hulls in Gibraltar, uh, Chris Capuro sells hulls in pretty well any scale you want from fiberglass. Uh, and he started out just doing MTBs. Uh, he ended up uh, standing on them, walking around his pool with them to make sure they were, they were watertight when he finished. Uh, because now he's doing everything destroyers down. Um, but uh, they're relatively inexpensive, and a hull is a good starting place, and you can then scratch build with lots of sheet plastic and, and, uh, and bits and pieces. And it's a, it's a challenge to, to uh, find parts and or to manufacture your own parts, like uh, winches and cable reels and things like that. Sometimes can be a bit crude, but you do what you can with what you have. Oh, uh, scale plans, I mentioned. When you rescale plans, the best way is to use your length and, be length and beam uh, of your ship, your overall length and your, your beam, to with a scale ruler. Uh, you can get uh, miniature scale rulers in, in whatever scale you're working with. Make sure that the, if, the, if the cruiser hull is 555 feet long, that it converts to the right length in 350 scale and that your plan is the right size after you've rescaled it. To do conversions, you're often cutting the hull. Try and cut it as close to the center as you can so that the distortion in the hull is, is um, necessary to, you know, I think this one I used, I removed about a three quarters of an inch or an inch, um, but it's, it's in the middle. And then fortunately I was adding a third funnel so it covered the the damage, uh, the hull can be fared in fairly easily. Uh, similarly with the, the cruiser, you know, you're cutting off part of the tail and you're cutting a section out of the hull and rejoining it. And, uh, you know, you can do it, but you have to be very cognizant of having that center line. Um, uh, so a jig is, is very important to keep it, uh, keep it lined up. Oh, with wooden decks, usually the uh, the best advice is to remove lockers and remove any obstructions on the deck before you try and apply the deck because that's what's going to mess you up when you're trying to unroll the deck onto the onto the or the applique onto the deck. It's going to snag on any anything that's in the way. So it's easier to cut them off, sand them down, nice smooth deck, apply the deck, and then re rebuild the lockers from from uh, scratch. Ladders as well, when you're doing ladders, usually ladders and watertight doors you're going to sand off or sand down, apply 
the photo etch pieces over them, bend the ends of the ladder so that they stand out from the side of the of the uh, superstructure when you when you put, put them on. Searchlights, it's a pet thing of mine, but I I very often will use either uh, sticko from Michaels searchlight or uh, lenses or and depending on the scale, use the smaller stick-ons. Uh, it gives a little bit of brilliance to the, to the searchlights, which may not be totally realistic, but it works for me. Um, they also make uh, good vehicle tail lights, which work okay as well. Then uh, you can uh, overcoat it with a clear color of clear green or clear yellow, whichever, to, just to tone it down so it's not too brilliant for you. Smaller scales are, are even more of a challenge. Uh, easy line and tippet line works very well, but you have to be patient. I find easy line uh, very nice and it keeps a constant tension on the rigging, but uh, will uh, you have to be patient with it because it tends to frizz and curl and not be able to be tied very easily. Um, getting back to rigging, if when you're doing your running rigging, I usually work again from the mast outwards using clove hitches around the yard and then over painting it so you don't see the, the lines on the yard uh, if possible. Bridge windows, depending on the ship, um, I'll usually use a, a, to me a clear green with, uh, with the uh, micro crystal clear. Uh, you can, if you need a structure to the bridge window, as I did when you rebuild the cruiser um, cruisers, you, you, I'll use a, a photo etch ladder to give you that square stu structure, sand it in and uh, uh, mesh it in as best you can, and then use the uh, micro crystal clear. Uh, you can add the drop of green to the to the glue uh, to, to the glue itself before you use it, and it'll dry nice and clear. Uh, I've tried using Bondo for, uh, or Bondic, sorry, for uh, hard plastic windows and scuttles in larger scales. Uh, but they tend to yellow uh, fairly soon. But if you want a nice waterproof joint, that, that works great. Um, so kit masts, use them as a template, build them as... as uh, you can solder them or you can super glue them, depending, and uh, use the crossbars and so on, a finer wire. But they, they will hold tension against uh, when you're tying, if you're, if you're not careful, if you, as I've often done, you rig one side of the ship and then you rig the other side of the ship and what you know, you've got a mass that's leaning a little bit. But, so you slack off and start over. Um, flag, uh, signal flags and halyard uh, dressing overall and so on. Uh, the best result, this is fairly thick, but you get the idea. Uh, apply your flag, cut around it uh, so that there's no uh, silver showing. Uh, in fact, I would glue it down with your uh, your white glue or uh, glue the flags down, paint over them with some uh, uh, clear sealer, cut the flag out, bend it over itself around the line and uh, tie it on. Because a lot of the time, you know, a cloth flag or, or a thing like that doesn't look very really realistic. Um, but the, the, the foil can be folded quite nicely. The other thing about scratch building, of course, now are, are 3D printed parts. The mar availability on the market of, of 3D printed weapons and uh, carly floats and rafts and boats and so on is far greater available than, than it used to be. I mean, the old airfix kits, you could never get anything extra for, for them. Uh, but these days now you can get any parts you want for any ship you want. And many people are rebuilding the whole basic kit from the hull up with with a better armament. Um, coiled lines and hawsers. Most ships have a plethora of 
of lines all over the place. And uh, larger capital ships, they'd be usually kept pretty neat. They'd be coiled on, on cable reels, but um, particularly warships and particularly small ships with volunteer navies like Canada's, there'd be lines all over the place um, to drive the XOs to, to distraction. Um, but, you know, I like to, to uh, in fact, I lost a contest one time because a, a, a guy from the Army was judging it and the white glue that I'd used to coil the line hadn't dried and it was still looked wet. But he didn't understand that, you know, you do see wet lines on a ship sometimes. But that was enough. Uh, so let it dry, flatten it down with some flat overcoat afterwards. It also helps to adhere it to the deck. So you can coil it around the end of a paintbrush, slide it off, and uh, get it to adhere to the deck, and then overcoat with some flat finish. Or you can flake it out as if they're uh, coming in, ready to use the line alongside. Running rigging, uh, I forgot to mention, covers all sorts of things. There's davit lines for your boats. There's uh, boom lines for your boat booms which usually project out from the side of the ship. And again, you're going to have lines that are on uh, pyramidal shapes to uh, allow you to control the boom or the cranes or the <coughs> davits as they swing out from the ship. I often see flags not flown properly. Flag etiquette's a very important thing to the Navy in most cases. The jacks are flown up the, at the bow the ensigns are flown at the stern or from the main mast, not the foremast, uh, although they will be flown from the foremast during battle. But usually they're flown, as in this case here on the tribal, they'll be flown from a small gaff or mast there. But when in port, they'd be flown uh, at the stern. Um, I mentioned submarines earlier. They don't all have to be dull. Submarines can be of any colors. and that's an example of the T-class submarine in a literal uh, camouflage scheme, which was experimental but very colorful. And it helped it to not be seen from the air. Uh, Italian submarines and British subs during the war were uh, often camouflaged a number of different colors. So different flags. Uh, flag Romeo usually means you're, uh, you're at the uh, ready for refueling, or you're a, day, a ready duty ship um, at short notice. Um, Foxtrot, this, this one here, would be uh, when you're conducting flying operations. Signal, s single flags had uh, usually an international meaning, so all countries would understand. Multiple uh, flag are in three to four flag groups, and they are done uh, usually when a ship's entering port, it'll fly its pennant number. Uh, so that you can see it, if you can't see the side of the ship, you can see what the flags are, or it'll, and or it'll fly, it's going to jetty number six, for example. Um, that's, that's very common. Oh, dressing overall, um, I had an example there of the uh, rainbow uh, dressed overall. There's a very specific sequence of flags, and I had a devil of a time trying to find this, the sequence uh, because, you know, they weren't just A to Z. They were, they were flown uh, in a particular arrangement that was pleasing to the eye from a distance. Canvas dodgers. And forgive me if I'm going on too long. Uh, feel free to tell me to belt up and go home. The canvas dodgers, um, such as, as uh, these ones, Micropore tape, surgical tape, works a charm. Um, on, I brought the wrong tribal. The, the other tribal I had, which I had a picture of, um, the uh, canvas dodgers were used quite a lot in the 60s on Canadian vessels. And uh, the Liquitex uh, mold making rubber. Uh, can be painted and, and uh, painted on over photo etch, and it'll dry to a nice finish that'll still show the, the undulations of the photo etch underneath, uh, and doesn't look too bad at all.
Um, actually, there's a picture of the tribal that I should have brought here in the, or the Micmac, here in the, uh, in the handout, and that shows you the, the painted Liquitex uh, dodgers in place. You can also use that for uh, either Liquitex or uh, tissue paper stretched with water and white glue for uh, blast bags on, on guns. Um, you can use them for uh, covers, boat covers, because a lot of the time the boats were covered. Um, this uh, oars you can make with a pounding the end of these with a hammer, cutting them off the right length, and uh, into the boat they go once you've painted them. Uh, you can also use the photo etch ones that come on different photo etch sets, but they tend to be too flat. We talked about deck planking. I mean, um, certainly the art walks, uh, self-adhesive decks are very good. Um, you can get some cheaper ones from China if you want to wait a month or two. Um, but, you know, you can also just paint a deck. And uh, you can, depending whether the panel line on the, on the deck is raised or not, sometimes they're etched uh, with caulking lines sunk, and you just do a wash, <coughs> sorry, paint your basic color, do a black or tan wash, and it will change the color uh, and uh, color the, the plank lines. If the plank lines are raised, which they used to be on the old kits, then simply running a lead pencil over them and then sealing them will often get enough of a contrast to be able to do it. I actually noticed in a photo etch set recently you can buy <coughs> photo etch sets now that give you a very long, a little narrow strip where you can just hold it down and paint the, the, uh, the alternate color so you get different plank colors showing up. Most of the time, there's not a lot of variation on decks. They're pretty, pretty bland, in my opinion. But everybody has different views of what they see as far as the palette is concerned. Uh, most cases, uh, wood decks are scrubbed to within an inch of their life with a, with a sanding stone. So um, holy stones, given that. Weathering. Um, <laughs> weathering is, is a, a topic that you can have to be very careful with. Um, wartime paints qualities were usually pretty poor. The weathering was pretty frequent, um, and uh, you'd, you'd often see under colors coming off. There's a, a color picture of King George V coming into Halifax, and she looks like she's three of the fifty shades of gray because she was painted dark gray, but a lot of the dark gray had just worn off, and you could see previous light gray undercolors coming through and it looked like a patchwork quilt. It was terrible, but um, unusual for capital ship. Smaller Corvettes and stuff, you'd often see the red lead peering through under the uh, the whites and the off-whites that chalked up and, and wore off very quickly. Best sources now, there's all sorts of camouflage uh, official instructions available. Um, Starling uh, in the UK on Sovereign in the UK have uh, published for like a $16 download you can get the Canadian, uh, confidential Admiralty fleet orders which gives you the camouflage schemes for every class of ship in the Royal Navy uh, for, sorry for the small ships uh, the interesting thing is the camouflage schemes changed when the ship changed where it was operating from so the Western North Atlantics were the, generally the white, gray, and, and West WA green and WA blue. But uh, uh, a lot of ships like Montreal there experimented with it because we were, she operated in Canadian waters for a, a while, so she had a lot of greens and grays. Um, there are a lot of very good references. The Raven Roberts reference series gives you all the official colors. Color coats come in different uh, colors. I prefer to use the AK because they're available, and uh, Vallejo because they're available, and uh, you can match them to the color chips. Um, this is part of the publication, the CAFOs that I mentioned. It gives you color chips that uh, 
you can use uh, very nicely and match Vallejo colors to those are the Western Approaches colors, for example. Um, I, I mixed up some Mountbatten pink for my Cornwall that are, or my Berwick that I did recently. And uh, it was kind of fun to see how different it came out to, from what you would expect. It wasn't really a pink, it was sort of a taupe. That, there's some examples of, of Sovereign Hobbies uh, color schemes for different ships, four stackers and, and H class destroyers. Uh, or you can get color pictures from the Canadian archives. Uh, or different sites um, that give you the the real. Uh, some of them are hand colorized photos, but some of them like that of Restigush in Halifax, you know that's the real thing because the colors are right there. Uh, getting back to the point of weathering, weathering is done. They they tried to keep their schemes as as pristine as possible. Uh, unless they were at constant, sometimes they were at constant things, but again, the weathering is not excessive. It's usually along the deck edge, coming down from bollards and bits and cleats, uh, or near where the boats are, come, are being raised and lowered a lot, there'd be a lot of scraping. And there'd be a lot of uh, oil and dirt along the water lines. Um, newly built ships like the uh, the Canadian frigates and some of the corvettes, they'd be pretty good color. There's an example of corvette with flaking of the white paint um, and showing the red leads coming through. And again, there's, there's a fair amount of color stuff out there. You just have to search for it. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of doing too, too much weathering, just enough to get the effect. Remember, under under the waterline doesn't tend to rust. Uh, it, it'll discolor and, and change, but not necessarily uh, show a lot of rust. And wood chips don't rust. But, you know, you have to think about some, some of these things when you do them. Water displays, there are different ways of doing it. You can do uh, bases from styrofoam or wood with modeled with clay or, or cut out and then usually uh, I use a gesso on top. A gesso can be tinted. Um, it should ideally, uh, before you put the ship on the base, be uh, airbrushed with a uh, faint green or faint uh, color to give you the different shades within the wake. Wakes generally also are almost always 20 degrees from the bow, no matter how fast the ship is going. And the only thing that changes is the amount of turbulence that you have on the wake. Um, and it's tough to get it right. I, I seldom get it right. So gesso with flocking material. This one, unfortunately, I tried to use the green. Uh, to me, I didn't spray it. I hand painted it on, and it, it really is a mess now. It needs to be redone but try and get that out of there easily. Um, but, and, and then the, the clear flocking material. If you're wanting smoke from a funnel, then you can uh, spray the, uh, or use vacuum cleaner bag filter material and tease it out for smoke. Hand making Carly floats, uh, such as these, for example. Um, you use the soft, tubing. Instead of the hard tubing that you use for your super glue applicators, you use the, the uh, IV tubing or, or uh, the soft polypropylene stuff and you can bend it but you have to keep it shaped so you can insert a piece of plastic rod or sprue into the center, bend it up, put another piece in the, in the other side and use it to hold them together and then you've got a Carly float or start of a Carly float. It helps and if you want a square one you just use four pieces. Um, but that gets you the general idea then you put the the racking and the and so on below. A lot of the uh, Carly floats and rafts on late war uh, escort vessels 
were colored yellow and red in, in quadrants. It was a dull red, sort of a round dull red with a, a dull yellow. Uh, I don't have a picture, unfortunately, of that with me, but uh, they weren't all just gray. Usually they'd be the color of the, of the uh, camouflage. They would often be uh, a canvas yellow, unpainted, or they would be yellow and red for high visibility. If, oh, I did have a picture of that, sorry. Yeah, you can see it right there. So that's uh, just one example of a Canadian frigate in 44. This was taken when they were escorting submarines into Scotland that had surrendered. And uh, there's a lot of, a lot of them that had uh, colored carly floats. And finally, the future, where do we go from here? Well, there's lots of display options for ships. The biggest problem is the distance with ships. I often see dioramas of ships where they're doing refueling or a RAS diorama where they're much too close together. The pressure waves would bring them in like that. Um, but you, you know, that's one option. You can do fly, flyco stuff. Um, wharf scenes and port scenes and dry dock scenes are all very common. Um, but you know, there, there are options. Um, Patrick and I were talking that 3D is the future for a lot of them. This is a 3D kit. Came as one piece. And I added the rest of the other hundred pieces from uh, the spares box or from rebuilding. Um, there, there are conversion kits out there that are being done in 3D. Um, there's whole submarine kits in 3D. Um, but they're all expensive, extremely expensive now. Someday they'll come down. And a lot of people are getting their own 3D printers. There's a learning curve to it. But if you want to do parts, that you can get just about anything you want in 3D. And that gives you many, many options for doing more ships. Okay. Um, certainly, naval stuff has changed. I mean, the Navy is now co ed, but they took away the grog, so there's no fun on board anymore, uh, especially in, the, in this day of diversity and equality. Um, but the flogging will continue until the morale improves. And that's all I have to say. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. I know I can learn a lot from some of you folks, so please don't hesitate to contact me if you think that you have a, an alternate way. These are were just some simple things that I've learned over the years. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>